Hey, Hawkeye fans, Chad Leistico from the Des Moines Register, along with Dargan Southern of the Des Moines Register. Uh, we are in two different locations, as you can tell <laughs> from the backdrop. Obviously, obviously, I have arrived in Orlando, went to Hawkeye practice today. We didn't have access to practice, but we talked to players afterwards. I'll get into more of that uh, as this YouTube Hawk Central show moves on. Tyler Tashman off today, but he will be with us later in the week. But the reason I have Dargan on is because he is a Tennessee guy. Uh, and I, I think it's okay to say you're a Vols fan, Dargan. Um, you cover the Hawkeyes, but you're a Vols fan. Um, and uh, you have a lot of insight around this Tennessee football program. So what more uh, apropos registered colleague to have on than you? Yeah. Um, and I'm actually in uh, the 865 Knoxville right now. So <laughs> Uh, I did not get sent down here to report the quarterback news, but uh, it was a nice coincidence. Yeah. So uh, get your pronunciation guides out. It's Nico Iyama Leava. Iyama Leava. So uh, yeah. it's interesting that both Nikos in the game have last names <laughs> and require additional help pronunciating. But, um, you know, it's, it's a, it's a big deal here. You know, this is a guy who, um, you know, his recruiting ranking kind of speaks for itself. Uh, got a hefty NIL paycheck to come here, several million dollars. Um, and this was always kind of a bridge year with Joe Milton at quarterback. But, you know, there were certainly times throughout the season when Tennessee fans wanted a quarterback change and wanted the guy that, you know, has been hyped. You know, a lot of people around here will tell you his arrival and his playing is the most – hyped for a Tennessee quarterback since Peyton Manning. So there you go on, on that front. Now, how this all ties into the Citrus Bowl, um, you know, I, I think that it's very possible that Nico goes on and has a great career and all the accolades held up, and he has a tough game against Iowa because um, I'm sure Iowa fans are used to, to hearing – disrespect from the SEC and, and whatnot over the years. But, um, you know, I, I would say there's there's respect for Iowa's defense from Tennessee fans, but I think a lot of people think that the results were largely generated because they played in the Big Ten West. And, you know, there's there's a little bit of validity to that. But overall, you know, I think this is, this is a great all-around test and purpose of this bowl game. You know, obviously – how much people care about non-playoff games are is a hot topic right now. But you look at this game, you know, Phil Parker has a chance to fluster and really go after a guy who has not played extensively, has not played in the first half of any college football game in his career. Um, and it's a chance for, for Tennessee to get a great test right out of the gates for a guy who's essentially making – um, you know, this is kind of the first start of his sophomore year, so to speak, in a way. So um, we, we heard some rumblings that Joe Milton may not play, you know, a week or so ago. And then it kind of came to fruition, uh, well, this afternoon, really. And so, so yeah, it's I would say that Tennessee fans were kind of meh on the game just because, you know, it's been a season that has disappointed a little bit. But uh, everybody's seems pretty re-energized uh, after the quarterback news. So uh, it'll be a, it'll be a fun one on Monday for sure. Yeah. Good. A uh, lot of stuff there, Dargan. Uh, Nico Iyama Leava uh, starting for the Vols uh, on Monday with Joe Milton opting out. Let's, let's just talk a little bit about the Milton opt out because uh, that seemed to catch several Hawkeye players off guard when I talked to them today. We, we caught them off the practice field. So uh, they were practicing pretty much when the news that Milton would opt out uh, materialized. However, it had been rumored. So Quinn Schulte and Deontay Craig were the two guys that were super surprised. And I want to say it was it was pretty genuine based on uh, the interactions that we had. Uh, those videos are actually up on Hawk Central. Xavier Wampa, on the other hand, the other defensive player that uh, got to talk to the three reporters that are here so far, um, you know, said, hey, we kind of heard rumors about that. But I will say, Dargan, we weren't allowed to watch practice today, but we could see enough just a little bit kind of walking by the practice field over at Celebration High School. They had our number seven 
jersey at as the dummy scout team quarterback. So they're obviously preparing for Joe Milton. And um, oh boy, I got a team. I got some people walking by me. Joe Milton. Uh, they're preparing for Joe Milton, and uh, this changes things a little bit, right? What is the difference between the two quarterbacks, as far as you know? Yeah, I mean, I would say that the way that they, um, you know, are expected to run Tennessee's offense um, are similar. You know, Nico isn't quite. I mean, he doesn't quite have the arm that Joe Milton does, but few people have the arm that Joe Milton does, and that's been his a gift and a curse during his time at Tennessee. Um, You know, I I think it's fair that um, there will be a lot of uh, safe plays, you know, even even within Tennessee's up-tempo style and being able to, you know, quick strike at at any point. I think you're going to see Tennessee's approach on offense reflect that they have a true freshman quarterback making his first start without – two of their top three running backs as well. So that's, that's certainly significant too. Um, So, yeah, you know, I think that Tennessee fans feel like the ceiling with Nico is higher than it was with Joe Milton. And, you know, maybe that shows up against Iowa, but um, you know, again, I, I think it's, it's a great test for Nico because this Iowa defense doesn't give a big plays it doesn't, it stays very disciplined. And so there's going to be very few opportunities to kind of pounce and, and take advantage of stuff like that. So, um, yeah, you know, I, I would say, it, in my opinion, I think this actually favors Iowa a little bit um, just because he is playing his first extensive action ever. And, you know, it's not, it's certainly not a challenge that you can kind of ease into on that front. So um, I've, I've kind of, I've tried to give the warning around here that Iowa's defense is legit and it's not just, you know, playing bad teams. Um, so maybe some of that will come around before kickoff, but we'll see. Um, but yeah, it's, it's going to be interesting to see, uh, to see everybody kind of handle the situation. <laughs> I'm amused. There was like nobody here when I set up my thing and now everybody is like <laughs> literally walking through this very narrow channel from the hotel I just need to the, see the pod through the smoking section which I'm in right now of the pool because nobody's in that nobody smokes anymore so I'm on the smoke right. and now people are just like <laughs> pouring into like this other section of this uh pool but it is nice here it's uh, it was a 70 degree day here it was sunny out uh lost my train of thought a little bit while you're talking but I'm excited <laughs> I honestly am excited this kind of energizes the game for me a little bit because it's definitely. like definitely. it's like okay uh, you know, I think people. It was interesting. It was going to be interesting to see how Iowa faced this high high tempo offense already. And Joe Milton was. I mean, he was. He's number ten on Mel Kiper's big board at quarterback, which I know. You know, number ten at quarterback may not even get picked. Maybe a day three pick, which is why the opt out I think surprised some people. Mm-hmm. Um, but I know he had a really good game against Vanderbilt, and he's put up good numbers this year. I mean, Iowa f- fans would kill for Joe Milton's. Absolutely. numbers this season i mean 2800 plus yards passing uh 20 touchdowns five interceptions i believe for the season and he's got good rushing numbers a 65 percent completion rate 7.9 yards per attempt so he's been efficient in that tennessee josh heupel offense and so it, it's it's got to be a drop off right and uh, i think back to last year dargan when iowa faced a true freshman quarterback after a high pro higher profile opt-out and Will Levis uh, for Kentucky, uh, Will Destin, I believe his name was, and he got uh, two pick sixes, and Iowa shut out <laughs> the Wildcats. Now, I think Nico is probably at a higher level, wouldn't you say, than, uh, than Definitely. Will Definitely. Destin? But still, it does – you know, Phil has made a living uh, of making it tough on young quarterbacks against the Hawkeyes. I just can't think of too many that have had a really good first start against Phil Parker. Yeah, and, and that's why I feel like Iowa's defense is – you know, gains a little bit of an advantage from this because, you know, for all of Joe Milton's struggles this year in the eyes of Tennessee fans coming off last season where, you know, they were in the playoff picture and then Hooker almost gets a Heisman invite and they win the Orange Bowl. That was kind of what everybody was expecting this year to look more like. And, you know, it didn't didn't quite materialize that way. But, you know, Joe Milton's obviously played a ton of college football and, is a veteran who, um, you know, 
would it would have been from that standpoint a little more equipped for this game. So um, I think it's I, th- I think it's going to be um, a great test because, like you said, I mean Iowa's defense doesn't you know young quarterbacks don't usually uh, have the success that maybe they have as their career unfolds. And so I could definitely see that being a case where, you know, down the road when Nico is thriving at Tennessee or thriving in the NFL, whatever it is, you know, Iowa fans can be like, well, how did that first start go? And so I think that, I think that's a very possible situation and maybe Tennessee fans don't agree and, and think, you know, well, we need 17 points to win. Surely they can produce that. Um, But again, I, I think it will be big um, to force. I, I think I would probably needs to force at least two significant turnovers. Um, and that's obviously been a f- key factor in helping out the offense in the times that they have scored is getting set up with short fields or, um, you know, the defense picking up a big stop in the red zone and, and shutting it down. So um, I think there's definitely a path for Iowa to win this game that isn't, you know, really really that outrageous by any means you're uh you're kind of our betting expert at the register not uh, trying to cast any dispersions on you but has the line moved i haven't been able to check since this morning uh, i saw it six and a half this afternoon so okay I'm so not, it did move maybe a point and a sure half if, yeah i'm not sure if that movement all happened today but I know that obviously that's a little bit of a movement from where the line yeah. initially came out on. It crosses the seven point mark. I mean, it was yeah. eight and a half. So uh, I think I would, I, I mean, I would probably bet Iowa to cover. I think that's a pretty safe bet. Um, the money line may be a, a little more, a little trickier, <laughs> but um, I, I, I would feel comfortable with Iowa covering both of those numbers. Well, let's talk uh, a little bit about Iowa's defense because uh, there was some news with Tennessee's offense today. There was news with Iowa's defense yesterday, kind of as I was uh, uh, making my way to Orlando. Jay Higgins, the middle linebacker, uh, becomes the first stay-or-go guy for the Hawkeyes to make his decision known, and he is going to stay and play a fifth year with the Hawkeyes. He was a true senior this year. Uh, did uh, expend his eligibility uh, as a true freshman, but that was during the COVID year. So that was his free year. So this is uh, this would be the last year he has left. Now he could get hurt or something and then get maybe a co- uh, you know a bonus year. But, um, but yeah, he's coming back for one more year. Uh, big news for the Hawkeyes, uh, and that was uh, needed. I mean, I feel like if you're going to rank – the guys you'd want to come back, I would put Cooper DeGene one. I would still put Luke Lachey two just because of what he means to the offense. But Jay Higgins firmly at number three and with Sebastian Castro probably four for me, uh, followed by Jamari Harris, Quinn Schulte, Nick Jackson. So uh, maybe not in that order, but, but something like that. Uh, so big news for the Hawkeyes, and uh, the Hawkeye players were pretty happy about it today, as you would imagine. I don't think anyone's going to say, oh, damn it. <laughs> We lost Jay. We, we, he was a clubhouse cancer. He, of course, he's the you know golden right. gavel winner is the best guy to deal with, uh, with the media. So you know, class guy, team captain, really means good things for next year. Uh, but I, I don't know, just as a, in a as a general guy who's who's covered the Hawkeyes with me in the press box for several years, uh, and on Tuesdays, I mean, what do you think of Jay Higgins coming back uh, to this team? It's got to mean quite a bit. Yeah, I, I really liked his answer that he had uh, when he spoke, um, when he was made available, I guess it was last week, where he said, um, you know, you got to make sure that the decision isn't something that you make in the moment. And I feel like that, the, you know, with all NFL decisions like this, you, you really have to make sure that the emotion isn't overshadowing, even isn't overshadowing the practicality of the decision, meaning, you know, if you look at Cooper DeGene, I think as much as Iowa fans would love to have him back, I think he probably needs to go just because, you know, the emotion of another year with the boys versus being a first round pick. I mean, you you probably need to take that. But in the case of Jay Higgins, his decision was a lot less uh, clear. You know, he was a guy who had a great season, but this is his first 
season of, of being that caliber of linebacker. And so, you know, I'm sure there were some people maybe not publicly in the NFL was like, okay, this guy had a great year, but you know, anybody can have one great year. So, you know, I think he's a guy who from that standpoint can definitely come back. If he has another year in the middle of Iowa's defense, that's among the best in the country, which there's no evidence to suggest that's not going to be the case. And he's kind of the spearheading it all. I mean, that's, that's a huge boost for your draft stock and just kind of the perception of where you are, which, you know, obviously that's a lot of the draft is, is, you know, the perception of guys building up. So I'm not sure exactly where he was projected to go. Um, I, I imagine it was, you know, somewhere in the middle rounds, but um, I, I, I like the decision. I, I think it's one that, that makes a lot of sense um, and it doesn't put that emotion over the practicality of the decision, which is going to get paid more in the NFL. So uh, big boost for Iowa. And yeah, it, it'll be interesting to see if that kind of starts a domino effect of key guys returning, which I think is certainly possible. Hey, I'm glad you said that because that was exactly what I wrote about when I uh, interviewed uh, Quinn Schulte about today. It's myself and Tom Kaker. We're here along with John Steppy of the Gazette. We're the only three here today, so that was kind of fun to have a little bit of exclusivity with the six players. Uh, I know more guys are coming tomorrow on the Iowa media, but uh, or today, actually. Um, and uh, But, yeah, Quinn Schulte said, yeah, it does affect my decision a little bit. And I was like, well, what do you mean? I mean, I just wanted to hear what he said. And he's like, yeah, like, if he's coming back, I would want to play with, you know, I would want to play on a defense that has him, basically. So, uh, yeah, that could help. Uh, that, you know, again, like you said, getting the boys back together. And I don't know. Yeah, Cooper DeGene, I would say, is still an extreme long shot, though I saw him at practice today. He he gave us a wave. Uh, and uh, no, no cast on the leg. He's walking. Oh, he's not going to play. He wasn't in uniform, but – uh, but yeah, so he's recovering nicely, which in a way also says like, yeah, you should probably go to the NFL because, you know, your yeah, injury you know, is not going to be an issue, you know, come combine. And I know that he said when he spoke last week that the injury wasn't going to affect his draft decision, but I really don't know how it couldn't because, you know, he was a guy who was just cruising right along, having an exceptional year as one of the best corners in the country. And the fact that he got hurt in practice, this, you know, everybody else's big injury played out in the game. His was the only one I believe that played out in practice. That kind of just emphasizes the randomness of football that can happen when you get hurt. And so um, he's, he's a guy I feel like of all the guys probably has to fight that, you know, okay, am I just making an emotional decision here? Cause I'm in the building around my boys or, you know, do I really need to go? And, and, you know, nothing in this sport is, is a given. So um, it'll be interesting to see what he ultimately decides, but um, I think, I think his was probably, and is the toughest of, of all the guys making, making that decision. And uh, another guy with a decision uh, potentially here to make is Nick Jackson, who uh, reportedly uh, has, been granted a sixth year of eligibility for or whatever fifth or sixth, whatever his final year of eligibility for Nick Jackson uh, because of, uh, you know, him being a Virginia during the tragic shooting that took some teammates lives that cut short the Cavaliers season. Um, I guess it was last year. Right. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, he comes to Iowa. Uh, they've been granting waivers for, for those Virginia players to have that extra year since they didn't get the full year, obviously a compassionate move there. But uh, I am kind of told that uh, it's still more of a possibility that he leaves for the NFL um, just because, well, I don't know why, but that's just kind of where he's leaning. Uh, and that would kind of make sense. He, unlike Higgins, has a very long track record of what he's done in college and what he does next year would not necessarily impact his NFL stock. And as we know, middle linebacker, wing side linebacker, whatever, can be pretty grueling and physically demanding. And, you know, he may be able to make some bucks next year on a roster or a practice squad. And, um, you know, guys like that, that are really uh, smart at getting to the football, you can still make a career out of that for a few years anyway. In the NFL. So, um, 
We'll see what Nick Jackson does. I'm going to say at this point a lean that he leaves, but the door is ajar for him to return as well. So he's on that whole long list of guys that, that could return. Basically, the other thing, Dargan, from today was Quint Schulte saying, you know, they've all been talking about it. And I think all of them are kind of, other than Higgins, going to make that decision after the bowl game now that they're here because uh, Higgins obviously did it, you know, on a travel day. Mm-hmm. It got it out of the way, but the other guys are going to wait till after the bowl game, it sounds like. So that's that. Yeah, and I mean, I guess once you get this close to it, it probably isn't a bad move to, you know, especially now that there's going to be some adjustment in the preparation. Um, and obviously even, you know, for a defense as elite as Iowa is going to take, you know, some adjusting to to a new – preparing at least for a new quarterback. So that makes a lot of sense. You know, I think – in Quinn Schulte's case and probably Sebastian Castro's case, um, a little bit like Higgins' deal where, um, you know, especially in Castro's case, this is his first year or this was his first full year being that dominant force and one of the best defensive backs in the Big Ten and really in the country. So um, I think he's a guy who um, will probably get a lot of, you had a good year, but it was one year question. And so if he comes back and, you know, is, is the centerpiece in their secondary, which all indications are that he will be. Um, I think that could also set him up for a big year that puts that last finishing kick in his draft stock and really, you know, gets him, gets him paid on, on draft day the way that he should, because obviously he's had, uh, a pretty swift rise, but it's been, you know, an emphatic rise in this defense. So um, I, I think both of those guys would probably benefit from coming back. Good stuff, Dargan. Just uh, let's wrap up here with some uh, finishing topics. Obviously, uh, you know, like I said, I talked to six players here today. We're going to get a handful, maybe five or six more tomorrow, along with Kirk Ferentz, also get a glimpse of the start of practice. So uh, probably the most – access of any day this week and then on friday uh scheduled to get all the coordinators at least they're on the docket but they've subbed <laughs> out uh brian ference for abdul ha- or abdul hodge will take brian there, real, real so, shocking. Uh, uh, however brian ference i asked uh i asked some guys yeah he is here he is coaching in the game so i don't think that's a surprise uh kirk ference kind of opened the door that maybe you know if he got another job he would go he would want him to stay uh, with the team, but uh, Brian Ferentz full speed ahead into his final game with the Hawkeye coaching staff. Certainly he makes a lot of sense on the NFL level and uh, Dargan, as you and I know, as NFL fans, a lot of openings are going to be coming here <laughs> in uh, about mid January, early January or so. So nothing to say, Oh, Brian can't get a job, anything like that. I think it's more good timing for him. He can finish it out here for the Hawkeyes. And on that note, uh, you know, I mean, Caleb Brown is a bullish guy, but he's like, yeah, we got a good game plan. And I do feel like if the Iowa offense is going to show something this season, and I know, you know, without Cade McNamara, without Luke Lachey, without Eric Gall, this bowl game gives us a chance to see something because your offensive line is healthier. Uh, Rusty Feth, healthier. Ru- uh, Mason Richmond, healthier. Uh, check out my video with Rusty Feth. He's he dealt with a, a major shoulder injury all of November. Richmond, Dunker, Logan Jones, all those guys are now healthy. Uh, you just got to think after a month of prep, that you you should be able to put together something offensively that makes a difference on Monday. Yeah, and again, you know, obviously Tennessee's secondary has been the unit that has been hit by guys going in the portal the most. Now, if you talk to Tennessee fans, most of those guys, they weren't too upset about them going into the portal because um, their secondary has kind of been the the glaring issue uh, this season. So point being that that all the intangibles are set up, at least in that regard, for Iowa to have a pulse on offense, which is really would be an upgrade from, uh, you know, the whole year, I guess, <laughs> at this point. So. Um, yeah, and, and on the Brian front, it will be pretty interesting to see where he lands because, you know, in in the bubble of Iowa City and Iowa football, you know, you would think that the man 
won't be able to go to Iowa City again by how much people dislike him. But I would imagine once you zoom out and have NFL people involved and all that, that, you know, his name and his coaching abilities are still looked at favorably enough to get another job. So um, I think there'll be a lot of, there'll be, it'll be interesting to see, to see what he does because, um, you know, it, it really could be a lot of things. And I don't think anybody truly knows exactly what is next for him. So um, that'll, that'll be interesting to follow as well. And yeah, it looks like unless something changes that the last time we will have heard from Brian Ferentz will be uh, the August media day. So he never made the the, co- the assistant coach appearance this year uh, like all the other assistants did. So no, I, I'm not I'm just laying out the facts. We just haven't had a chance to hear from him about this offense, which has been even worse than last year's statistically as hard as that is to believe uh any other little nuggets i'm trying to think from today uh, there was one question in here that i thought was interesting yeah go um, for it is iowa using the headset communication with the quarterback and the tablet during the games oh I'm that's good it's been yeah. a bowl game topic yeah good question um we, we did not get uh any anyone like deacon hill i'm guessing we will tomorrow would be mm-hmm. my guess we would get deacon hill tomorrow and obviously Kirk Ferentz as well. And like I said, I mean, that would even be a question we could ask Abdul Hodge, uh, you know, on Friday if we need to uh, surrounding that. So I don't know the answer on that. Uh, haven't been down here long enough or hadn't enough access to figure that out yet. But that's a great question. Uh, so no sign stealing. I think we were, we're at practice today. And you could see into the practice field, but we were kind of ushered quickly away from sight lines or whatever. But it was so funny because – uh, there were two bicyclists that like apparently like rode by and like, Oh, there's like a team on the field. And then just started like shooting, <laughs> like shooting like photos, like through the fence and stuff. And I was thinking, you know, we were making some Connor stallions jokes. And of course I <laughs> doesn't, doesn't like anyone snooping on their practices. So. Yeah. I mean, this is all under the context that reporters get to view no practice throughout the whole right. season. So, <laughs> so it's just kind of funny to look over at these like passers by like, well, you know, shooting stuff about practice, and you're like, "Wait, Cutter Stallions!" You know, <laughs> that's what he would do. Right, you know? right, right. So, uh, but that's anyway, funny. yeah, good question there. Um, yeah, I can't. I mean, we'll get. We have another podcast plan later in the week. Kind of our five big questions, game preview stuff. Uh, hopefully, Dargan, you're available to join us. That would be great. Get a little more Tennessee perspective. And Tyler Tashman, Tyler Tashman will be back for that one. Um, I guess we we can talk you know, two minutes of hoops here in our last couple of minutes. Cause you cover the women's team. Uh, they got a game in action this week. Uh, things, uh, you know, going pretty well for the women, right? Uh, Caitlin Clark, everything. Um, I don't know. Give us, give us your, your top line takeaway off the Hawkeyes. Uh, who'd they beat Florida Gulf coast? Uh, Loyola was their Loyola, last one. Not Florida Gulf coast. I don't know what I'm um, Yeah. Florida. You know, I mean, I, I think, you know, 12 and one in the non-conference, they doubled back and got, you know, the other win against Kansas State after losing to them. Um, so I think on the court, everything looks pretty much this, you know, like Iowa wants it to look. Um, you know, I think the offense still has a few moments where it kind of feels like it's going to be done by Caitlin or it's going to be done by no one. Um, so, you know, I think that's the goal to change that between now and the start of the NCAA tournament when. Um, you know, everybody's going to be needed to, to do something. So uh, Minnesota at home on Saturday, uh, Minnesota has been a team that's looked better so far. You know, I think they're in the first four out of the bracketology right now, um, but it's been a team that I was taking care of pretty, pretty easily over the years. So wouldn't expect a ton of drama in that one, but um, you know, as this big 10 schedule heats up uh, it's going to, going to start magnifying any issues that are there, which, you know, through the month of December was a little lighter than the month of November for them. So, um, yeah, I I think everything's kind of pushing along and I'm sure there's a lot of people who would want to fast forward to March. I, uh, I'm sometimes in that boat. Um, but yeah, you know, it's, um, you know, and then, and then obviously Caitlin got a lot of social media love at the chiefs game, uh, on Christmas. So that was that was cool to see. Uh, it wasn't good enough to get them a win, but uh, 
I, I did I did actually see a, a loose uh, narrative because, you know, Caitlin, they lost the game on Christmas and they lost the game to Philly on Monday night when she was on the Manning cast. So there's a there's a loose narrative that Car- Caitlin Clark is a uh, bad luck for the Chiefs. So I don't know. Uh, if that, <laughs> I don't know if that's uh, going to hold true. I, I don't think it will. But uh, that was that was. A, hu- a very humorous moment uh, from that, but yeah, I think I think this week was good for them to recharge and uh, should jump right back in to Big Ten play with plenty of confidence. Yeah, I think another even more famous female has being uh, uh, blamed for the Chiefs' failings this oh, year. Oh yeah, well, sure. <laughs> I was waiting for that picture to come out. I I, I figured they would link up. Uh, you know, yeah, Caitlin and Taylor Swift. That would have been yeah. a pretty sweet photo, actually. Yeah. But, anyway, but uh, I don't know. Uh, she's she's in high demand these days. So yeah, got Clarkies and Swifties, right? Everybody's uh, everybody's <laughs> in red right now. <laughs> All right, Dargan uh, Southern. Thank you for joining us with some Tennessee expertise, and uh, we will join Tyler Tashman later this week. We'll get you the final schedule when we iron it out, but. Uh, Thanks for joining us on this Wednesday, Hawk Central, in place of tonight's radio show. For Chad Lystico, Dargan Southern, saying thank you and so long.